Live from Dawson City, this is Derailed Trains of Thought. Hello, Tim. It's uh, cold here. Yes. I don't know what the podcast is thinking bringing us... In the middle of June. I know, I'm enjoying the sunlight and the warmth, and now I'm in furs. and None of these buildings have central heating. No, it's, everything's a little old-timey here. Uh, like, like not just like fake old-timey. I feel like we're actually back in time. Like, there's a, lots of whiskers and petticoats. I, I guess that is a thing a podcast does, isn't it? Yeah, we've we've gone back in time before. It's true. We really it's should true. use that more often for just for our own advantage. <laughs> I don't know if the podcast would cooperate with that. Well, probably not. Uh, I feel like that's using our its power to uh, selfish ends or something. Yeah, they probably wouldn't like that. With great podcast power comes great podcast responsibility. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I think maybe we should go into one of these taverns or something and warm up a little bit. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Maybe we could play one of those, like a little, uh, play some cards or one of those cup games. I think that, yeah. I mean, it, I look like some of these guys have money. Could be. This seems like it's a pretty thriving town. There are a lot of bobsleds going back and forth and it's good I commerce. feel like uh, Yukon Cornelius would love it here. <laughs> Well, yeah, you'd probably feel right at home. Yeah. So, but yeah, let's get inside and we'll we'll, we'll start this thing. Okay. So, Tim, um, while we're getting ready, what's new in your life? Oh, you know, since see, since last time we recorded, we've had Memorial Day, That's and true. Um, I got engaged. Hey, congratulations! Thank you. I think there's a drink on the house for you here. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, do we have to go upstairs? <laughs> is, is I just, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. I should have caught that Muppet Master. <laughs> but thank you. Yes. Since we last recorded in early May, Janelle came over and it had been the first time we had gotten to see each other um, since the whole quarantine went down. Loving and, the time of quarantine. <laughs> something like that. And uh, I was like, you know what? It's silly. We want to be together, so we might as well make this official. And nice. So I had just one question, and, and uh, she said yes to it. Quite emphatically, too, I might say. So she, she knows you time travel occasionally, right? Yeah, she's listened to the podcast. Okay. She's a fan. We good. might uh, we might hear something from her later on in the show. Oh, good. All right, then. So, But how about you? Is there anything new in your neck of the woods? Nothing. No, okay. So I am going to, in this next uh, school year, start teaching English language arts at middle school level at uh, St. John, where I went to school and where I go to church. Mm -hmm. And so, you've, yeah. you've done some teaching in the past. <laughs> uh, I know if you listen to our old podcast, I probably talk about writing, being a writing teacher. And I, that was more like a step-in gig sort of thing like come and do a couple hours but this is like I'm legit well, part-time part part-time part part -time. yeah <laughs> sixth grade homeroom uh, ELA middle school so. and yeah so you, it should be interesting you excited I am you nervous excited yes I am uh, <laughs> I, I could say the same thing <laughs> <laughs> we're exactly have the same emotions for completely different reasons. <laughs> yeah, different shades of emotions yeah. there, I think. So may maybe being out in this bitter cold will smack some sense into us. <laughs> get us back on our feet and get yes. us a uh, man up. Man up, yes. <laughs> All right, Tim. First up is Story School. So, Tim, last time we talked about nature, mm -hmm. and I had recently read Call of the Wild, which I had read, I guess, probably in middle school, and reread, and it got me thinking about how um, civilization or, and nature influence people, characters. For instance, I mean, to use an obvious example with Call of the Wild, the whole theme of the book is that Buck, this dog, was hanging out in California, just living a nice, cushy life. He's kidnapped taken to the up north, and then he kind of learns to be more wild, more wolfish, and eventually becomes the leader of this wolf clan up in somewhere in the wilds and kills lots of Indians and stuff like that. Anyways, the idea of the call of the wild is that nature in that case made him wilder, made him more savage or mm. more, more himself because he's a dog. Right. But then I got to think, there's a lot of places in literature and movies where 
both ways. Both nature is used to influence a person, some of the bad, some of the good, or civilization comes in and changes our characters. I thought it wasn't something I'd never thought much about. I thought, hey, maybe we should talk about it on the podcast. Yeah, and it might be a nice follow-up. So kind of as a comparison, last time we talked about nature and in terms of descriptions, getting you a feel for the atmosphere in a natural setting. Whereas in here, we're kind of jumping from that into kind of an exploration of what is the relationship between nature, the wild, and human civilization. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I guess we'll start with one is that I think in many books, nature is a savage influence. Silly example, you know, we mention loss occasionally, Um, but Claire gets stranded on the island. We come back and she's crazy squirrel, Claire. Yeah. (laughs) You know, she just, you know, she's all crazy and half mad and... It's the experience in nature that makes, that brings out the animal, that that becomes more animalistic. You know what? I was thinking when you're talking about Call of the Wild, I remember seeing... I guess it was a TV special, but I don't know if you remember Charlie Brown. They used to do like these TV special books that were basically just oh. would take some pictures from the special and yes. in, in a book form. Well, there there was one where Snoopy had a nightmare about being in a Call of the Wild situation, <laughs> and and as a kid, I remember looking through. It was like it was actually kind of disturbing to see Snoopy go feral. Go feral, yeah. I never, I don't, I don't remember I ever saw the actual cartoon, but it's it, it was surprisingly dark. Like you know, he had to fight for his food and all this stuff, and I think it winds up ending like in a tragedy, even like in the Bob said, wide up like going across ice and and the ice cracks under them, and <laughs> as he's like sinking in the waters, when Snoopy wakes up and is scared and goes into the house and basically sleeps in bed. With Charlie Brown. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fun. And it was interesting, but it was it, it just kind of ended with that. It was like, well, that was weird. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I didn't I don't think I knew at the time what it was a reference yeah. to. Yeah. But yeah, there's interesting things about seeing someone taken from humble circumstances and made more. You know, there's certain stories where that's a good thing. And in Snoopy's case, it was kind of a disturbing thing, at least for kid Timothy. Yeah. You know, yeah. And you're right, I think you can go both ways. But with the, you know, with the, you know, the more wild influence, you know, even in like fairy tales. So there's that musical Into the Woods, which I don't like much. Yeah. But uh, I think we've mentioned that podcast. But, you know, that whole idea is that the woods is the uncivilized, the where weird things happen. You know, there's town safe, the woods isn't. It's a place where you, you're stripped from some of your safety nets. And I think sometimes, I don't know this for sure. But it seems to me, especially like late 1800s, early 1900s, where there started to be this big difference between the civilized Mm. world and like the unexplored, you know, whether it's Into the Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad in Africa or, you know, Call in the Wild and the Yukon Uh or other places. So there started to be this this sense of like, and you had this sense of Darwinism coming in sometimes in books Mm -hmm. where suddenly the wild was, you know, primal nature. You got Lord of the Flies where the kids go there and they become savages literally uh-huh and um you can tell me better i, I watched uh, treasure plant the other couple of weeks ago with my kids and ben the robot <laughs> was crazy which i assume is the same thing in the book it's been a long time oh yeah book. ben gun oh yeah no yeah. he's 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 definitely nuts, nuts. after yeah. having been uh, marooned for so and, long and again and that's the same thing that you know kind of struggle with um less so much the muppet version of treasure island <laughs> <laughs> what is i forget what's well miss piggy is benjamina gun <laughs> <laughs> and she basically just becomes the queen over uh, a tribe of feral pigs okay and complete miss piggy style <laughs> that that sounds about right i do remember that vaguely now <laughs> And you know what? This is interesting to me. I think sometimes this same idea has been modernized as sort of like moving out of civilization to our more primal selves in some of these dystopians. Oh, that's an interesting Where suddenly parallel. people become, there's always that quote, like, we still got to be human. Mm. Um, when they're, you know, suddenly they're living in Mad some, Max. Mad Max. Yeah. And I think it makes sense. There's nothing, you, you know, necessarily surprising about this thing. But I think it's an interesting commentary on what civilization provides for characters Hmm. yeah in the um in the stories where it's it's better for where the character winds up going in the wild it becomes better for it like i keep thinking of this 90s movie called shipwrecked oh i think i've seen that whereas i think it's a kid from the swiss alps who you can't quite uh 
defend himself and then he gets shipwrecked on an island and basically winds up like rigging it up Swiss Family Robinson slash Home yeah. Alone style to fight off pirates and and you definitely get the sense that like he's a better person for having gone through this wild experience. Okay, let's go to the good side because there there are a number of books like that or movies where the wild makes you better that somehow civilization had um hurt you mm -hmm. like Swiss Family Robinson is the same way I mean at the end he's like they think about going back they're like no this is better than where we were going uh -huh. you know and they make a new colony basically. Mm. <laughs> Although, I mean, that's also a story where they're very much taming the wilderness around them. Well, that's true. And Robinson Crusoe the same way. I mean, the entire book is basically like, I'm going to make this as civilized as one man can make an island <laughs> with as much stuff that I can get off the ship as possible. I mean, I, I had started reading that and I haven't got through it yet. But, you know, he's playing a garden. He's domesticating goats. I mean, it's like playing Harvest Moon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It it had occurred to me to maybe look for an Animal Crossing uh, <laughs> song for a soundtrack later on, which I didn't. But <laughs> and you know we do have this impulse that some you have you have a bunch of stories where the good ending for the protagonist is to get away from the city and live on a farm by himself, mm -hmm. or like it's the Picard in no no the. I think it was, was it, was in gen that is that in generation? Oh, then also in generation. It's in not in generation. I feel, who, is there like a, generations? I thought there were, well, I'm, I'm not a Trekkie in this yeah. show. Nathan can correct us. But I thought I remember that there was some episode where he wound up getting marooned on a planet for a while yeah. and wound up spending years as a farmer or something. And I think they played off that with Picard where he's a. Yeah, I think he's a, like, has a vineyard or has something. Has a vineyard or yeah. something. Like that. I haven't seen it, but I think that's how he starts. Yeah. So you have this sort of idyllic, Eden like sense of nature is back to our true selves. Mm -hmm. Nature is away from all the thing, corrupting influence of civilization. So you have these two very interesting dichotomies. Well, well, I think there's even like, if you think about it, and I hadn't thought about this until just now, there's almost like a spectrum between these things. You Like on the one hand, you have crazy Claire, who's yeah. isolated alone, just goes out of her mind. Yeah. Um, then you have somewhere in the middle is where I would put Shipwrecked, where it's like the story of, it's almost like a boy coming of age kind mm -hmm. of story. Hatchet. H Hatchet, yeah, that's a good example. Uh, My Side of the Mountain, which is about a boy who runs away from home and basically lives on his own. And it's very much like, it's got some trappings. He, he's not lost his mind. He's made... These are characters who have made nature their own, but they're not going so far as to, like, domesticate it. So, so in some ways, in that middle ground, nature is a purifying force yeah. in some ways. Yeah. A, a, a maturing A maturing form. aspect, yeah. You learn to fend for yourself if you were used to, like, depending on your parents yeah. or someone else. And in the process, you become deeper and wiser and stuff. And then on the other end of of uh, living out in the wilderness is complete mastery over your domain. <laughs> yeah, and, but you're by yourself is like, it's like the, you know, I guess there's some movements like back to nature where it's not just, hey, we should have more locally sourced food, but like we should abandon cities altogether and just mm -hmm. live one with like off the grid and everything like that, which I think is, I think there are benefits. I think it's an awful lot of things As, you don't think about that civilization yeah. brings Yeah, or can be. I mean, that's a very isolationist yeah. choice to make. But the flip side of all this, these are all like, you look, nature you know, makes you your worst self, a better self, is Eden on Earth. I guess, let's stop before I do anything else. I guess from a Christian point of view, I think those are all interesting stories. Oh, sure. And I think they're all true to a certain extent. They, they can all be true, yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's notable, Robinson Crusoe, for example... If I remember right, it's been a long time since I read it, but I think part of the reason why he's able to develop and flourish as he was, because doesn't he become a better Christian as a process yeah, of... Basically, he wasn't really one at all. I mean, he basically converts on the island after he crashes, and then he, his he starts seeing providence in the provision of, like, his the seeds and stuff. Yeah, his dependence on God is mm -hmm. really, you know, helps him maintain his sanity and really helps... Depending on God helps him flourish, and it's. I mean, his is kind of, you know, when we say Eden like, his is kind of like, hey, go and tend the garden. I mean, that's mm. basically the Robinson Crusoe. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. From what I know of it, uh -huh. obviously in the fallen world, you got the whole law and club and fang, you know, nature red and tooth sort of mm -hmm. version. Yeah, and <laughs> which and again with the Darwinist point of view, that's even more heightened sometimes. And we've been picking on Claire, but to be fair, being alone on that island would drive <laughs> a lot of people crazy. We, we can we get the French lady too. She's crazy. <laughs> that's, that's true. Russo didn't fare much better. <laughs> I forgot Claire kind of became a second Russo. Yeah. 
And then obviously, you know, we have this sort of, you know, new heavens, new earth, where we'll be in more in tune with nature. Hmm. Way uh, down the road. Way down. And, That's and, a future story. But we do have some sort of, rom- we, you know, there's this different levels of romanticizing yeah. nature, you know. So, but the flip side of this is how we view civilization mm. in books. How do, you know, how does the city, the society, again, sometimes in this dystopian society is the, the thing that's broken. You want to get away from, you want to escape from mm-hmm. the capital. Mm-hmm. You know, the capital is, a, is the source of evil. Or in um, the Divergent series, it seemed always seemed to me the people that were the happiest were the farmers. Mm-hmm. It wasn't the people that were living inside the the streets of what used to be Chicago. And it seems like if civilization is a bad thing, then you, you're, I mean, in some of these books, what the source of problems is not people, it's some part of the system sometimes. Corruption of some corruption, sort. Some sort of corruption that society has either weakened us or been controlling you or you have no freedom. The morals have deteriorated. The There's no justice in the system of some sort. Or it's just a simple fact of, I guess in some ways you could say being lost in our own vanities, mm-hmm. pride, or, or like what Vanity have you. Fair in um, Pilgrim's Progress. Yeah, yeah, true, something like that. Where part of the capitals being terrible in Hunger Games is obviously the fact that they're oppressing everyone else, but also that they're so decadent on the mm-hmm. inside that they have no, they're they've lost sense of right and wrong. So there is a sense that sometimes that decadence and civilization go together. In mm-hmm. some in some store, and it and it works real. Enemy is a really powerful image because I think intuitively, in the same way that we feel like there's something about nature that's good that we should get back to, I think intuitively we think there's something about wrong with the world we're living in that we need to get away from. Mm-hmm. And it's easy to place it on decadent society, which is at least partly true. Yeah, I mean it's partly true. It, ha- it can go too far sometimes, and on nature's end of things. <laughs> yep. Avatar with the blue James Cameron's Avatar with oh, the blue yeah. people uh, definitely is on the side of oh nature is excellent, humans are bad, mm-hmm. military bad. bad. Yeah. It's very blank no, strokes no, there. No, I suppose. Strokes. I suppose. I mean, not to defend Avatar necessarily, but in a book or a movie, you're really going to be able to show all the angles of some of these complicated things you'll probably pick one or the other to lean into one view of nature uh, somewhat i mean i think the one the movie that i could think of that does that strikes the best balance between the human civilization and nature is, this is a miyazaki it is princess mononoke <laughs> yes and i did not even realize this the first couple of times i watched it i probably said this on the podcast before but I think because we're so accustomed with movies to seeing things one side or the other, yeah. that it's very easy the first couple times you watch it to completely dismiss the good that the humans are doing. The, the balance that's there. Yeah, because like all you see is like, well, they're clearly like corrupting nature that we, we've yeah. seen in hundreds of movies before. Yeah, okay, it's, that's it, an exaggeration. But, you know, in, not much one. <laughs> in plenty of movies before. Happy feet. Yeah, or... Uh, Fern Gully? Fern Gully, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> or Pocahontas. I mean, even if I haven't seen some of these, I know secondhand this is what they're about. And, yeah. Or you get it from plenty of other cartoons. And so that's what, kind of what you expect. But then I remember on, on later watches, it's like, but she's taking care of lepers and former mm-hmm. prostitutes. This is not the sort of thing like a villainous does. And that's the real tension of the real world. Yeah. <laughs> that, you know, people want to declaim society. We've made massive progress in life expectancy and mm-hmm. and health and all kinds of things that comes from civilization. I mean, it's it's very easy. To, you can point this at America. It's very easy to look at all the problems that we're having in America today. And it, we do have tons of problems, yeah. obviously. But when you compare that to the rest of the world, you're like, well, hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. there, there are obviously good things that Western civilization has made mm-hmm. um, that has helped humankind and... But we're a complicated species, yes, for sure. <laughs> so, related to all this, and kind of a special case is the kind of the theme of the noble savage, the wise primitive, the you know the Tarzan. Tarzan is, is a good example, right? There's actually a noble. I forget his name, but from Brave New World, uh, everyone lives in the city, and then he's like mm. from the middle. He's like from a primitive place, but he's the only one that can like live normal. I don't want to think about how long it's been since I read Brave New World. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I remember when I was a kid going to grandpa's house, my grandpa's house, and he'd always have some sort of whatever Fox was playing on and Sundays. And a lot of times they were 80s action movies or cowboy or westerns. And a lot of times they have some sort of mystical noble savage. Sometimes it's the Indian. Sometimes it's 
just the old okay. coot who they're more in tune with the land and they're wiser than mm. I think that's just an interesting again Tarzan is probably the best because he's he's interesting just because he was raised by animals and he's brutal but he also is like Lord Grey Greystone no Grey I don't recall oh but he, like beginning book two he's all dressed in a suit he lives in England but then he goes back so he's like in both worlds uh huh um, which is yeah, kind you've, of interesting. You've re- I don't think I've ever read any of those. I know you've read a couple. I, at least the first one made part of another. And I, I wonder if that's kind of a Rice Burroughs thing, too, hmm. to, to move to... Because, you know, like, Prince of Mars is both sort of like... I not read it. But. Yeah, but from what I've seen in John Carter, Mars, yeah, it has kind of this mix of uh, Nobility royalty and, and, and uh, not savagery, but um, masculine strength, I yeah. guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't remember. It's been a while. So I, don't I would know. like to watch that movie again, actually. I but. don't know if the if the females have that same sort of like inner strength, or that's just more something that we would have brought it to modern versions of it. That yeah, I have. I've not read Princess of Mars and should sometime. It would be interesting. We need to remember. I think it's been nominated for the book club. Yeah, so, okay. one we got to remember in the future. No, have you read the Jungle Book? I have not. Okay, not either. But I would like to know how Mowgli fits into this sort of. Hmm. Layers of how nature, you know, because it might just be fun nature stories. I don't know. I've not read the original source. The actual one, yeah. That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, just thinking about the Disney movie, I guess there is one where, like, they decided, no, the humans should be with the humans. Yeah. So, I mean, everyone kind of had in their own domain, which is interesting. It's not quite noble, noble savage, but it is a... Uh, the civilization is, humans were meant for civilization. In yeah. That case. Yeah, basically. And that there's a there's a good influence there. Anyways, reading Call of the Wild brought these these ideas up that and I don't know. I seem like older books have a more, or maybe I just haven't read enough modern books that has this idea. Unless it's a dystopian, you know. Unless mm. it's this sort of idea that we need to restart, we need to reboot. That somehow we've gotten too decadent, we've gotten too tied up in our gadgets and our stuff like that. Yeah, I'm curious now that when I think back about pop culture. I'm trying to remember when some of these things like Hatchet or other books about kids out in the wilderness, yeah. when that would have tied into other things that were going on at the time. I don't remember when those came out exactly. I mean, I know the, the Davy Crockett um, miniseries that Disney Channel did was hugely popular and that inspired a lot of interest. And maybe there was some of this going on already, a lot of interest in frontier, mm-hmm. um, historical frontier kind of stuff. Um, and they're, you know, that's similar. That's very Americana, classic yeah. Americana, mm-hmm. going out into the exploring the new. Very Roosevelt. Yeah. <laughs> or or Lewis and Clark, like we talked yeah. about last time. Um, and I don't know if, like, there are other, that these real life stories inspired some of these fictional books. I don't remember the timeline there exactly. I don't, I, I don't either. I don't know when some of them came out. I know when I read them, but that's completely right. Different. I mean, I guess. Survivor stories have always been a thing. Well, like, I mean, Survivor, the... Um, well... Real, no, but I'm saying the part of the appeal of that is, like, what will people be when you strip everything else away? Kind of, but it's also with the game show Well, okay, show I know, but aspects. I mean, some of the... Yeah, I agree. I've always been very skeptical about that part of Survivor. <laughs> like, it's like, really? How much are they really off, off on their own when they've got camera crews all around? Okay, I, yeah, but you, but you do get... so. You, it's interesting to... I haven't seen it for ages. But interesting to see... Obviously, a lot of the game show and cutthroat for that, but you also have this, the stress of having these things taken away. Yeah, yeah I'd say it's not a huge genre but it has a genre that in some ways i don't think it's completely gone away there was a movie recently called arctic with uh what's his name mickelson the guy who's a villain in a lot of things he was a villain in casino royale okay. and dr strange basically he's surviving out in the arctic i know it because it was a movie made by a former youtuber that was not too long ago i remember back when i was in film school there was that movie about the guy who like had his hand crushed in a boulder oh, yeah. and he had to like what was, it, what was that called? 128 hours something or something like that. like that? So, I mean, because... Gravity is sort of a survival movie, even though yeah. it's not really a nature thing. Not but. really, but you do... Oh, oh, you get bits of that. I was just thinking of uh, The Martian. Mm, is, yeah. You know, is basically... Again, the survival story is the, probably the purest, like, man versus nature right. basic plot. Uh-huh. But I wonder... Does, and sometimes it changes them. Sometimes it's just a foe, mm. you know? Like Hatchet tends to change, you know, like some of these shipwrecked tend to change person, but sometimes it's just obstacles. And I guess the uh, that one Leonardo DiCaprio movie a few years ago, oh, the, the Revenant, Revenant, yeah, which I never saw, but I know is like about him versus a bear essentially. Yeah. yeah, it is interesting. Well, I guess Castaway is sort of along those lines. Yeah, because yeah, 
Now, how, how does it be that story really is kind of about how it changes him, but what would you say was the influence? Because at the end, I, more of my memory is more just that he feels lost back in the real world. Yeah, honestly. Which is an interesting take and probably more realistic than that. Yeah. More. Castaway is interesting because it is very much like a, it has imagery that sticks with you. I mean, Wilson! Yeah. But I, I remember feeling at the time kind of the, a so what aspect to it. <laughs> like one of these like, like those stuff happened, but did Tom Hanks character really grow or is he just like kind of a sad husk of a man at the end? Yeah. It's, it's, it seems more of what the end result was. Yeah. Yeah. So um, less, less uplifting than Robinson Crusoe in well, some ways. Well, Robinson Crusoe was amazingly like, this is all for my, you know, take joy when you suffer trials of many kinds. I mean, that's basically. <laughs> I guess that's a good point. <laughs> but what fascinates me is just like how, how it reveals human nature. And I think the man versus nature doesn't necessarily reveal human nature. Sometimes it's just like struggle for mm. without any chance. I mean, like in Lord of the Flies, it reveals, oh man, these kids are horrendous. <laughs> you know, so it's like, oh man, these guys are creative. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess that's an interesting point. So the take out of all this, like, you talk about the the basic plots and it sounds like you're boiling everything down to like really just formulae, but honestly, there's a great deal of variety in this kind of stuff. And what you say with how man and nature and creation, mm-hmm. what their relationship is, will reveal a lot about a creator's worldview, I think. I think you're right about what's wrong with the world, what's right with the world, what we're meant for. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a good wrapping place. All right. A wrapping place. I like that. <laughs> I, 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 this is where I would bust into a wrap, but I have no wrapping skills. <laughs> nice. All right. I guess I will take the first soundtrack. So for my uh, soundtrack, I like to try to pick new games that I haven't picked a song from yet. And I thought, well, what would be better when we talk about nature and mankind than Cheetah Man 2? <laughs> Cheetah Dude. Man 2, which never existed, apparently. I was going to say, I had never heard of this. I never heard of Cheetah Man 1 when you said No one really. Ha- it's like an internet, like, <laughs> cult thing. <laughs> that makes sense. But, like, 2, I guess, was never finished, but a half-done one is available, and apparently the music's It was like a fan-made? No, I think it was half-done originally. Oh, And okay. then they abandoned it but people got a hold of it somehow and anyways because <laughs> cheetah man because you're half wild and you're half civilized cheetah man so that's uh, my reason okay. yes anyways this is a uh, living large remix by he used to be known as another soundscape but now he's known as by his real name which i will butcher which is matthias hagstrom gert swedish i believe okay um nice but, job as far as i can tell yes thank you but i hope you enjoy
And we're back. Hopefully you enjoy that uh, peppy little song. It was fun. And now we'll move into... Listener Feedback. So you may remember, folks, when we did a sidetrack a few uh, months back, when we had talked about our bookshelves, we invited you to send us a audio clip or video or what have you of uh, some of your bookshelf. And one of our faithful listeners did. Yay! And uh, she is actually probably our most beautiful, uh, most devoted listener. Hey, now. And Natasha listened. I had to argue with you. <laughs> <laughs> But she doesn't. <laughs> but she doesn't, so you're good. Probably because she hears you talking often enough anyway. Uh, mostly, yes. Whereas in my case, my fiance has been listening to our podcast in order to get years worth of the backstory on me. <laughs> the flashback. <laughs> yeah. it's uh, She has a little a bit of an unfair advantage that way, I think. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, and she was kind enough to send us a video about showing off uh, one of her bookshelves. And particularly, she wanted to talk about uh, some of her Christian and spiritual books and so so here is her presentation. Hello, Tim and Nick. This is the book collection of mine that I am most proud of. There are other books in the living room, but this is the one that I keep by my bedside. This is all of my spiritual stuff, spiritual reading. I am a church musician, so I have hymnals from a few different denominations. Things I've picked up were for you over time. The Catholic Heritage, that was a very interesting book to read about what um, people of the Catholic faith across the centuries have contributed specifically to the world. Hidden in here is a book of poetry, Gerard Manley Hopkins, which I have not read a ton of. Haven't run a, or read A Sacred Sorrow, Michael Card, um, but what I would like to, it's about lament, the value of lament in the Christian life. Uh, denominational hymnals, and all of my spiritual reading, much of which I have yet to read. Henry Nowen, Richard Foster, a book on Lectio Divina, a book about forgiveness, that's getting rid of the gorilla. Everyone dies but not everyone lives, that's about developing a rule of life. Coming home to your true self is about um, self-examination. Hearing God from Dallas Willard, who is John Ortberg's mentor, probably a mentor to a lot of other people. Awakening Faith, a bunch of devotionals I haven't read. And uh, these four books here are all the same author, Ruth Haley Barton. She designed the spiritual retreats that I go on, uh, pursuing God's will together about discernment in a corporate sense. Strengthening the soul of your leadership is about leading from your soul, not just your head, or even just your heart. Sacred Rhythms, that's the big, broad overview book for the Deeper Journey group that I go on, a little bit spent on each discipline. And Invitation to Solitude and Silence is focusing specifically on how to be still with the Lord. Something a little ironic about um, having a book about being still, but, you know. Shaped by the Word, it's about how to prayerfully read scripture, and then to Dietrich Bonhoeffer books. I've read a little bit of The Cost of Discipleship. Haven't read Life Together yet, but they all look interesting. Anyway, go derailed trains of thought! So there you go. Thank you, dear. That was very nice of you to uh, send that in to us. I just say I'm super impressed by all the hymns, hymnals. I mean, it makes sense for her, but I've always, I think I have a hymnal on my bookshelf, on one bookshelf. But I always thought it'd be neat to read it and just for like theology and stuff. And I never have. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, it's an interesting idea. I guess it'd be kind of like reading, I mean, not quite the same thing as reading the Psalms because it's not actually scripture, but similar idea. Well, it depends on the hymnal. Either you get good ones or bad ones. But. Well, I suppose that's true. <laughs> We should also shout out while we're doing listener feedback. Last time we did listener feedback, we had read a review that we got on Apple Podcasts. And then like, I think it was like sh just before the episode went out and I realized that there was another one on the on Apple Podcasts, another review, which is really nice of you. So thank you to Sister Winter 30 um, If you are a relation, I apologize. I did not recognize uh, you directly by your writing style. <laughs> 
and I won't read it all now, but it's very complimentary. So thank you, Sister Winter. And th- thank any of you who want to uh, leave us a review, give us ratings. On, or just share us with your friends. Or just share us around. Yeah, we, we appreciate hearing from, uh, from all of you. So thank you very much, uh, Janelle and Sister Winter. And one nice thing about that review you read it is it says that they really enjoy What If, which happens to be our next segment. <laughs> What if? It's been a long time, it seems like, since we've done what if. It's been a while. We've been quarantined and other things. That's true, because of quarantine. And we have a nice, we've expanded our repertoire or circulation of uh, second half segments, I feel like, which is nice. I, I do enjoy the variety. Yes, I concur. So today we decided to go to kind of our, go to back to our standard, um, pull things out of a hat. <laughs> it's it's helpful, but each time we do this, we we do some sort of pull out of the hat. We have a new scenario that we are pulling for. <laughs> Dun <Dun-dun>. uh, <laughs> Anyways, today we have two hats. Actually, we've doubled the hats. <laughs> um, it's like playing one, Mario Odyssey. One for each of us. Yes, but we will pick a random wilderness location that we we both threw some in, and then a random. Urban, civilized, civilized character. protagonist. Yeah, someone who's not normally in in out in the wild. And we thought about doing it, doing some the other way, where we send a native to some civilized place. But then we realized that like those stories have already been told. Yeah, there's not very many native characters where they haven't been thrown into civilization yeah. somehow. So we'll just do it one way, unless we get clever. All right, Tim, give us our first locale. Okay, so I've got the hat of the locations. And our first one is Antarctica. Antarctica. All right. So, and you said we need to give them some... Something. Like, let's just assume they have... A coat. A coat. <laughs> and... A do backpack. We, do, we, do we give them, like, a tent or not? I don't know. I, honestly, I don't know a lot about survival in Antarctica. Okay, let's give them a backpack with, like, a tent. Uh, okay. That's a, that's a place to start, anyway. But they're, like, they're just hundreds of miles from anything. Right. Okay. I don't know how they wound up there, but they at least have the very basics they need to survive. And uh, <laughs> uh, we're um, putting Alice from Alice Wonderland. Oh, dear. In the Arctic. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> um, how old is Alice here? Uh, let's oh. say, what, what, like 14, 15? Okay. Is that what is that the traditional age for? Is she younger? Ten? I, th- I, w- I would have guessed younger, like twelve, like ten, but I don't know. It's Let's make her twelve. Twelve. Okay. Twelve. It seems like a good balanced. It depends which version you're. Re- I mean, yeah. I think she's more ten in the in that book in the original books. Yeah. yeah. But there's been enough stories about Alice since then where she continues to keep going back and has yeah. lots of other adventures. I mean, Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, Alice basically became like full fledged adventurer. Yeah. By the time she was. 18 or whatever. Yeah. But. So, okay, so Alice, let's say she's 12. Okay. Uh, she apparently came out the wrong rabbit hole. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I feel like she just wants some tea and... Tea and crumpets. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And I uh, think, I, I feel like the first thing she would do would be sit down and talk to her invisible cats. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Are we going oh, with the... Oh, Dinah. What am I going to do now? Curiouser and curiouser. Are we going with the theory here that Alice is insane? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but she always, she ends up in Wonderland. She's like, man, this is strange. She's just like, she's never like actually like thrown off. She's just like, this is weird. No, that's like, true. That's true. We just, we were just talking about invisible cats. I didn't okay. know if you meant like imaginary animals or no, if we were talking about the Cheshire, like her, Cheshire cat. Or, like her time. Well, it could be, it could be like, oh, Cheshire cat where, so I guess you could think she, there's a white rabbit, but it's just the snow. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's, that's really sad, actually. <laughs> this um, is a sad... What have we done to poor Alice? <laughs> okay, maybe she can find a penguin. Okay. Okay, maybe that, that, that puts a, a better spin on this. But, but did she, she kill it and eat it? I was just going with she befriends them. Okay, and she was dies of hunger. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe they maybe, uh, they they help her if she befriends them. They might get her some raw fish to okay. eat. Okay, okay, I can see. I you know I can completely see her sitting with her penguin, just talking to the penguins like. And they just I, kinda, I just miss home. I kind of just want to go home. And they Why just kind of here? they just kind of accept her as like okay yeah sure. I have a feeling she might get some frostbit like toes and stuff. Mm-hmm. Because she's not I mean, she's not real. I mean I'm glad she has a coat on. I, I feel for her though if she's still wearing her standard British dress. Yeah, and this might be stereotypical, but is she going to know how to put like her tent together very easily? Um, 
I mean, she'd figure out eventually. She she would figure figure something out. I feel like I've never seen March of the Penguins, so I don't know if the penguins find some sort of shelter. Like, do they ever rest in caves or how? No, do they, they, they they shelter have, each other. They just shelter each other. And they, they like have switch out. I lots think lots of feathers. Okay. And I think like they move around, so someone's always in the back. And it's like negative. I think it's like negative fifty when it's bad or something. Yeah. Yeah. So. Poor Alice. I, I'm not sure she's going to survive this unless she managed. Uh, me, she's just going to wind up talking to penguins and then freezing to death. Maybe some penguin will like sleep, get, like slide down into some hole and she follows and she ends up in some sort of wintry wonderland. wonderland. <laughs> 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 in a winter wonderland. <laughs> That was completely accidental. I didn't realize what I was saying until we <laughs> we slipped into that. <laughs> so, so, or it's all a dream. As she's I, I hope going for her, bit. I hope, hope for her sake it is. So it's like not an actual adventure. I, I feel I like, don't see how twelve year old Alice is going to survive this. No, see, here's the thing. I don't see how she survives it, but I think she might enjoy it just as the same. <laughs> That's possible. At least it won't be horrible. At least you know, she'll may, have friends. She may not survive the night, but she had at least a nice day of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like twinkle, twinkle, oh, little man. penguin. Probably, I, I apologize to any feminists out there. That's uh, it's like sure Alice would survive. It's like I don't know. She's a, still a twelve year old. No, I'm not sure some, a twelve year old boy would survive. Okay. Some of the some of the movie Alice's would survive. Oh yeah, yeah. No, some of them are hardcore. The the older yeah the older Alice from Alice Once Upon a Time in Wonderland. She'd do fine. Or there was, what, I, there was the sci fi Alice. I think like she was pretty like whacked out. Or like she could like fight and stuff. I, I wouldn't so be surprised. Might, yeah, ride a penguin back home or something. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. All okay. right. Next one. Oh, <laughs> I mine was Antarctica. You had an Arctic circle. Okay, let's skip that one. Skip that one. Yep, okay. skip, yeah, we'll we just, want a new locale. We'll just toss it. New some, some I figure there. some might might overlap. Yeah. The moon. The moon. So okay. So spacesuit. Spacesuit. And maybe seems like we should give some sort of tent like some sort of space some sort of a base or some a, sort of like 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 a rover or how long were that the astronauts on the moon they didn't say over there overnight i don't think so or not very long not, not more than long, a day no so let's let's say maybe just a rover like you can just live in your rover okay but you can but you can get around then at least sure, sure. okay who are we sending to the moon i don't know charlie brown <laughs> Poor Charlie. But I have a feeling oh, all I can envision are like three panel comic strips of him looking at the earth and like just saying really depressing things. <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> I think Snoopy should be with him though. I think Snoopy would be would be rescuing him somehow. There's, yeah. I, I mean think, we've had I think there have been storylines when Snoopy went to the moon, you know, in oh, his, really? well, in in his, his dreams. In his in his yeah. daydreams. And some somehow Snoopy wouldn't be involved. I, feel I like. have a feeling Charlie Brown left on the moon by accident or however he got there might just spiral into a depressive state of like <laughs> staring like- at the sky. Though he might look, look at the sky every once in a while and be sad and then have some sort of revelation about the beauty of nature or mm-hmm. God or something. Mm-hmm. So you can remember something Linus said about something. I can see that. He might be like, man, I'm sorry, red redhead girl. <laughs> I feel like the story would have like it would have started with him marooned, but eventually Snoopy would rescue him, yeah. and then it'd be all okay again. And, and it'd be and it'd be kind of philosophical and introspective, like Charlie Brown can be. Mm-hmm. But I think he'd find some beauty there. He'd probably like try to do some jumping and like <laughs> maybe he tries to hit a football that someone left behind, right? And he exactly. just rolls over, over, over and over and over again. again. Or at least he doesn't land as hard as he usually <laughs> does. <laughs> okay, someone doing these Charlie Brown the Moon strips would be actually really good. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Let's do it. All right. All right. <laughs> Next, we've got Deep Jungle. Deep Jungle. I figure, okay, I need to get one of yours here, Tim. Steve Urkel. Steve Urkel. In the right. jungle. <laughs> Did oh, I do that? He, he fell and he can't get up. Um, <laughs> I have a feeling it would not go well. Um, <laughs> Although, you know, it depends on how old Steve is, like, because he was able to cr- invent some pretty creative stuff as he got older. Like, that might actually help him out a lot. So maybe, maybe he'd be a sort of like, like he would survive, but he'd get, he'd just be injured constantly or constantly like it's things sort of, being taken ten times longer than it should. I, I kind of feel like a, you'd have a Gilligan's Island sort of thing going on. I think that's actually a really good comparison, <laughs> where he would he would make a pretty impressive like home base for himself but like not think of the right sort of things to figure out how to actually get back to civilization like he gets bit by piranhas or he'd have like some sort of rash constantly you know mm-hmm. 
But yeah, he like he he'd get his food and stuff, but it would always be. And like if he if he had, could just figure out the the right practical thing to like make a compass or yeah. something. I feel like there'd always be like some sort of like panther that would constantly like harass him. You know, it's like 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 the alligator in Captain Hook. Okay, <laughs> but, you know, it's like like he's always avoiding it somehow, and it's like always this close to almost getting caught by this panther. Uh-huh. Maybe he would he would try to befriend a. Uh, maybe there actually is some like natives in the area that he tries yeah. to befriend, and he just winds up just annoying them constantly. <laughs> there was head hunting him. <laughs> you know, he wouldn't go tragic like he he like breaks his glasses like a Twilight Zone thing. He can't oh, see. Dear. But no, we won't go. We won't no, go I feel there. I feel like he would have like a like a monkey partner. Okay. Like who just hang out in his tree house he made, or a parrot, or, or a parrot, a, or both, or both, sure. or a monkey with a parrot on his shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> a Strange. parrot with a monkey on his shoulder? <laughs> okay, stop. <laughs> so I actually I'd also watch this. I, I would watch I think this it'd be a great sitcom. It'd be it's Smash Family Matters and Gilligan's Island together, and you've got that's TV that's gold. Genius. Right there. That is gold. That would be fabulous. <laughs> so like so is the rest of family matters there? Like they've kicked him out into his own treehouse because they get he messed so much stuff up. I wasn't going quite that literally, but I suppose you could. <laughs> so so far we have a horrible story. Alice dying in the Antarctica. <laughs> Charlie Brown being rescued by Snoopy on the moon. Nice. And uh, Steve Urkel living and uh, annoying a bunch of natives it's, it's, in it's a deep like, jungle. So it's like Swiss Family Robinson plus... Plus Urkel plus, shenanigans. Yeah, Gilligan's Island. Okay, I, I like it. I, I, I'd watch that. Yeah, fun stuff. All right. Uh, next one, you can tell me this is too similar. Deserted Pacific Island. No, but you've got ocean and beach and stuff. Let's let's take it. Okay, okay. Well, maybe it'll be less, more rocky, less jungly. Like maybe there's okay. some jungle, but not a mix of terrain and and yeah, there's kind of the isolation. Like Steve, if he had been smart enough, he Urkel, he could have he could have figured out how to get back to civilization. Here, you're just stranded. You're just stranded unless you can make a boat. Yeah, and what, a raft. You, any supplies that we're giving it, giving this person? Let's give him like some sort of tool. Okay, like a axe or a gun or a axe seems like a let's good do thing. an axe. Axe that seems good, nice and practical. Because if it's we'll say it's a tropical island, so he can chop down at least some trees. And you're not gonna, I mean, you're not gonna freeze or anything. Yeah, yeah. So Sir Robert Chiltern. <laughs> that, okay, who is this again? That is my character from oh, An Ideal Husband. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> So okay, so, so Robert Chiltern would uh, he would of course be very distraught at uh, being separated from his wife. So real quick, the for the audience, he's oh, sure. he's basically an aristocratic in the Oscar Wilde play play. Yeah, so uh, and British, he, British and British aristocrats in the play, he's dealing with this blackmail thing. He's about, very proper. He's very proper, and he uh, is in Parliament. And, and all this stuff. Okay. So him being cut off from civilization, and be, he'd be pretty distraught from being cut off from his wife. But yes. I feel... Would he wear a suit, like, just nonstop? <laughs> I would guess eventually it'd be hot enough. He'd take his coat off, but he'd probably leave the cravat on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's fabulous. And keep a journal. And keep it. He would definitely keep a journal. Yeah, oh, he, ab- absolutely. He, so he the could, first thing he goes for. I need to find some ink. <laughs> he he has to chronicle his escapades. So if at the very least, if he dies, people will know how how awesome he was at doing what he did. Yeah. After he would get over the initial shock of being deserted on a tropical island, I think he would become enterprising. He's a very driven individual. So okay, I th- yeah. I th- I could see him basically trying to tame the the island to his will. So would he be a Robinson Crusoe type? How would he differ from? I mean, would he try so? Would he have the try so many different things, or would um, he be more just like? I mean, would he civilize it, or would he just kind of like eke out an existence? You know what? I feel like it'd be a little bit closer to the eking out. I mean, it's it depends on how long he like. I could see him really like going for the trying to get rescued thing. For okay, a while. so he's for a long time. He's just he's bonfires and anything to get noticed. Yeah, bonfires. Sending messages in bottles, whatever mm-hmm. you can yeah. do to get rescued. I feel like it would take him a while to get into the okay, I'm gonna have to live here long term okay. sort of mindset. Now, um, but at the same time, I don't think he would necessarily starve. He would figure out patterns, ways to sustain himself. So he he he's he's motivated and he can just create a rhythm of life. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So and like I can even see 
It'd be interesting. I mean, I don't know if Oscar Wilde would agree with this or not, but I could see Robert Chiltern having a spiritual awakening through okay. the experience too. Would he be at all witty during all this, or is that more his friend? That's more his friend, okay. to be honest. He's not the the dandy. Would he make a? Would he make like a? Not a constitution per se, but like a. Like, like a life statement, like here's what my, you know, sort of since he was on parliament and stuff. Possibly. Like I mean, write once, out what, like here's what my purpose in life is here. He would, what, yeah, my... that would be part of his journal, I would guess. Okay. Yeah, if he's doing a journal, yeah, it would okay. be part of that. All right, next location is an active volcano. Ooh. Interesting. Um, how does someone, what do we, someone need to survive at an active volcano? I think like it's rumbling, there's lava some places, but it's not like, explode oh okay but he would need what do you think like a a suit or the a suit or a i don't know how like, close someone, like a shovel i don't know how close someone gets to an active volcano well you don't want to be on an active volcano but right. i mean like in theory i'm I'm thinking kind of like it's a not like, like a but, small version of hawaii like it's okay. there's lava and stuff but it's not like okay. there's places you could be on the side of it we're not talking a mount st helens here no we're talking more like lava flowing from okay yeah. okay i got you so, I don't know, a shovel? Uh, rubber boots? Rubber boots. Yeah, rubber boots, I think, I would okay. say. I don't know. What, what do you do with a shovel? I don't know. I, I, someone with the ash and, I don't know, make a little cave. I don't <laughs> know. I'm just, I don't know how. I don't know. Okay. I'm making stuff up. <laughs> well, we'll see. Who, who are we sending there? George Bailey. From It's a Wonderful yeah, Life? From It's a Wonderful Life. You always got to bring George Bailey into these things somehow. <laughs> well, I thought he was very normal, so I thought it was worth throwing him. He's very urban. Yeah, fair enough. Um, huh. <laughs> I don't know how he would deal with that, honestly. I feel like he wouldn't have a reason to stick around, to be honest. He would just... But how did he get away? Well, is he on an island? I, I'm going to say most volcanoes are islands. Okay. So I'm going to say, I'm, you got to have a way that he can't... Right, right. So maybe that's too close to the too island cl- thing. And it's another ocean, but... That's true. Uh, yeah, it's true. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what Okay, to do well, let, let's say he has to survive... For some reason, maybe he's, let's say he's looking for someone. Okay. Maybe that would be a reason he would be there. Yeah, that's the reason he would be there. He's looking, he's trying to, someone, so we'll, we'll say then that he took a boat to this place. And, he's and he had a find, boat, and he has, he has tried to find someone, and the, meanwhile it's going off, there's lava, there's... Okay. I feel like he was a Boy Scout. Wasn't he a Boy Scout? Yeah, I think he'd be very resourceful. Yeah, I feel like he would have some some ideas about where to how to track do the trackings, try to find. I feel some like the, like the if he had to jump over something or if he's resourceful and great. I mean, he doesn't. Here's the thing: he always wanted to be a hero, like yeah, his that's brother. True. That is so very he, true. He, he, I mean, he'd probably throw himself maybe more than he should into it. I mean, here's the thing: George Bailey in this situation would be quite different from the George Bailey we know, like toward the end of It's a Wonderful Life. Oh yeah, life. he'd be much more like because this sounds more like a George who got to do all the travel that he had yeah. wanted to do. Okay, see, so he was traveling. He had his, he had his, he had, he had his case. He, he, he's actually probably pretty happy. He's probably like living it up. Yeah, this is what this is what I came out here the, to do. The, the first guy who's like, yes, <laughs> finally an active volcano. <laughs> <laughs> the alternate universe, George Bailey. <laughs> so I mean, Ad- adventurer. So it'd be kind of like um, Francis Ford. Co- no, 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 no. What's the director's name? Uh oh, Capra, Frank Capra. Yes, Frank Capra. So it's like him doing a George Bailey story. When he's doing Lost, what is that other movie? Oh, Lost, Lost Horizon. Lost Horizon. <laughs> you know, it's weird. It almost makes me think like if George Bailey had become this like traveling adventurer, would he have been like, it's almost as if like an Indiana Jones type adventurer character just settled in a small town and became a bookkeeper. Yeah. Like that's the alternate universe of what would I kind of I kind of really dig that. So we could do like a okay, I'm just going off the survival thing completely, but <laughs> with the, how nature influences him, like- he becomes like, yeah, he goes off on these adventures and he comes back and does the savings loan thing. Uh, and he just has all these artifacts so, in his room. And like <laughs> his house his house is full of like all these artifacts from places. So it's like so- I'll and, you know, he's gonna rope the moon, so someday he's gonna go up, he's gonna, you know, go find Jules Verne and they're gonna go to the moon. <laughs> I love it. It's I, it's a, like a, a count it by by day, adventure by night. I th- that'd be great. Of course, no wonder he's your uh, he's your hero. Exactly, and <laughs> and um, Jimmy Stewart would be great. Yeah, I, oh, I'd no. watch. I'd watch all kinds of episodes of that. No kidding. Yeah, I just makes Jimmy Stewart did some westerns. He did a number of westerns, but I don't know if he ever was like a globe trotting adventurer. That would that would have been pretty cool. That would have been pretty cool. Okay, <laughs> I I think. That worked out way better than I thought it should have. <laughs> I wasn't sure it would at first. 
I mean, we did have to ditch the whole like wilderness. Well, I mean, we yeah. took a, d- but, a different vibe. But we've been on talking it. about how it affects a person, and so he he just lived it up. He <laughs> seized the day. <laughs> that's that's true. That's so true. okay. So I'll, poor I'll uh, poor angel never gets to get his wings. I guess. <laughs> I'm sure there's someone someone maybe, else who needs his help. Yeah, maybe maybe we, we wound up helping his brother. Who knows. So, so random. So maybe adventure, and then every once in a while, this angel shows up and like tries to. Anyways, go ahead. <laughs> it's like we, we need the, the George Bailey like uh, dime novel or uh, or like comic I'm doing book series. It. Here we go. <laughs> web series. Here we go. We'll do a web comic. George Bailey as adventure. I, I'd love to see you make this pitch to whoever is. It's a Wonderful Life. That's that was RKO, wasn't it? I wonder if that's in public domain. Or if you'd like have to do a pitch to like whatever studio oh, owns man. the rights. Okay, to that. those artists or writers out there. I mean, I am a writer too, but someone needs to do some format of George Bailey travels around the world. <laughs> oh, All right, that's amazing. All right, rural Kansas. All right. So basically, flat farmland. You think Indiana's flat? You haven't seen Kansas. Okay, is this going to work? Nothing. S- Spider Man. <laughs> <laughs> See this. I've seen a gif of this very sort of thing <laughs> where Spider-Man is like is hanging out on a barn or something and shoots a web and then jumps in and just lands flat on the there, ground. There's nothing to do. There's nothing out there in Kansas. That's He's ex- going to take up running. <laughs> like, no, seriously, the Spider-Man's powers. Is he a good runner? Probably. I mean, I mean, I don't think he's he's no incredible Hulk in terms of like leaping. Yeah. But I imagine there's some of that. So a, a cross-country Spider-Man. I guess so. And but yeah. silo to silo. Like, would he, he wouldn't even have necessarily a reason to use the web shooters, though. Just prob- to scare off cattle rustlers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what, what kind of crime is he fighting out there? <laughs> is he like visiting some long lost cousin? And <laughs> See, I, I wanted to send Spider Man to like the jungle or something like that. Kansas is like the one place I didn't want to send so, him. So, okay, anyway. okay, you have to make a comic, okay. and it's Spider Man in Kansas. What is the plot? Um, what time period are we in, though? I don't know. I mean, are we like Old West sort of Kansas? The West was farther out, though, wasn't it? Was it always? Well, maybe not. I don't. I mean, I honestly don't know. I, I mean, I always think West being like west of uh, probably there was some overlap. It's, it's, with Kansas. I mean, by the time you get Colorado, it was really weird. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, say say it's like Western Spider Man. Like he has okay, like okay, I'm he, listening. Uh, he's, he's a, I mean, that'd be easier in like gun slash web slinger. I mean, that'd be easier in Arizona or something because well, you get like Monument Valley and th- things like that. Although I just had an image of Spider Man swinging off a cactus. <laughs> <laughs> Those are like his guns shoot webs, <laughs> you know? Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, sure. yeah, wow. and he can. He can he like? I guess he and can, he can, like if like if so, you know, there's the, like a stampede. He can just stand in front of the kid that's going to get stampeded, and then Simba doesn't die. Sorry, wrong thing. <laughs> well, that's wrong. Yeah, cotton. yeah, wrong, wrong cotton. But. Um, but no, you could do things like that. Like, yeah, rather than lassoing, just throwing webs to maybe it's probably more of that's probably more of what it is. He's probably using it more for like telekinesis as opposed <laughs> to like swinging around. I mean, I don't know how much survival this is at this point, but oh, that's true. I forgot about that. Oregon Trail Spider Man. Yeah, or yeah, something like that. Yeah, I was trying to think what what I was thinking with like rural Kansas as a nature sort of setting. I guess I was just thinking in terms of like being out there and on the plane and there's not a lot to do out there except for your thoughts. So I guess anyone who is stranded in rural Kansas would try to probably use the stars to pick a direction to go to figure out where they wanted to go. You might find it relaxing after the hustle bustle of of New York. Of course, after a while, I'd probably miss the hustle and bustle. Be like, it is far and quiet out here. (laughs) That is very true. That is very true. So how would it affect him? Would he come back? I mean, would it be like, oh, thank goodness I'm gone? Would he come back like, oh, that was, I'm not just friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, like there's other people out there? Yeah, I, th- I think he, yeah, I think he would, he would have a fresh appreciation for that. He might spend some more time in Central Park. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I see being out there that much time alone, which I think is different from like being in, say, solitary confinement. It's yeah. It's a different kind of alone because when you're out in nature. And I think he he may have come up with a deeper understanding of himself, so he'd become like Superman in some ways. I mean, I mean, since he's from 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 Kansas, that, it, yeah. it, it's kind of it's kind of fitting. I mean, I guess a lot depends too on how old Peter Parker is at this point. That's if we're true. talking like high school Peter Parker or college age young adult Peter Parker, that's true. What he could come away with would, would be kind of different. 
So, so more introspective. Yep. Do we have yep. time for another here? Let's do one last one. Let's go Arizona Desert. Okay. Princess Peach. Princess Peach. <laughs> Interesting. Um, she's usually not, I guess not all the games. It's some of the games she's like just waiting to be rescued. Right. Yeah. It, 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 depends does, on the depend game. On, it does depend on the game. So what is she doing out there? I mean, so she's like just in the desert. Like she's not by civilization or anything. This is hard because I don't know that like, Princess Peach has that much character development. No, she can't make a cake. <laughs> no. No. Um, I mean, but, but I guess the thing is, it needs it to develop. It's going to develop her into a real character. You know, it does depend though somewhat on the game. There's some of the Paper Mario games. She's captured, but she finds clever ways to like interact and help Mario while she's in the bad guy's lair. Maybe she'd do a little bit, like not crazy, like you know, f- crazy French lady. But maybe she'd get a little more, just like not fair, but like free, wild, hmm. like r- discover her independence. Okay. She finds you know, like she starts off and it's hard and she's has no and then she finds some water and then she probably you know tears her dress so it's yeah you her, know. her dress can't stay quite as immaculate anymore it has to be she has probably yeah tear it down to just the minimum yeah more like with. well you know and then I'm sure she's got petticoats under there yeah exactly <laughs> well I mean like you do Mario Kart she's she doesn't drive in her dress normally no that's true that's true. Um, but yeah, yes. maybe she Especially she really if, she, if she's on a motorcycle, she's all tan. I mean, she gets all tanned and burnt out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Her hair just she cuts it super short. It's just a hassle. Does she have something to cut her hair with? With her machete, we left. <laughs> <laughs> we forgot to give her. Yeah, a we forgot tool. to give her. I figured she needs some sort of. Let's give her a knife. A knife okay. or or some sort of blade. Yeah, so she can. Slash open cacti, oh, yeah, which she feels bad about because you know sometimes those desert levels they probably those, have eyes. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and she's like super freaked out that like nothing like has eyes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and there's no blocks. Uh, at least she's she's used to like snakes and things like that. And she's not really scared of any of the. No, she wouldn't be scared of any of the creatures. I mean, her kingdom is full of all kinds of stuff. Yeah, so that wouldn't be a problem. She could if she needs to climb up some of the monuments or. Or some of the rocks, she doesn't have an issue with that. I know, and she can kind of float when she jumps, like in Mario. Yeah, 2. that's true. That help, that might help her with on some if there's like super hot sand. I, I, I feel like like she stayed out there long enough, she be, she would become like a like a legend for people around there, like a Bigfoot sort of legend. But like, but you know, at the it's, same time, it's, it's the desert princess. I feel though, at the same time, since she's gone through a lot of traumatic things without ever really losing her sweetness, I feel like it, it wouldn't change her too much. Now I think about it, she oh, she became yeah. more independent, but I feel like she'd still be this pretty sweet. And I feel like when she got back, she'd Gentle. just go back to being her old. Yeah, like or, she, like she, she act like nothing, nothing happened. Nothing happened. It's like, yeah, that's fine. Like Morrow comes, like, oh, okay, I guess we'll go home now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> That'd be kind of awesome, actually. She's out there. She's doing all this like crazy stuff. Then she goes back. She's like, hey, Morrow, you want me to make you a cake? <laughs> uh, you know, that's kind of actually like, that's I kind of like that. Oh, so it doesn't fun. change her. Just gives her another, another side of herself, layer. and then yeah. she's yeah, yeah. Like I said, she's she's been kidnapped often enough, and she's become used to it. So yeah, she's like, Whatever. it's just an, it's just another day, yep. another day in the life of a princess. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. I like it. I feel like she would make a castle out in those like you know where they have the the Indian ruin. You know the, oh, the, okay. the she would make some sort of castle in the side of a rock wall. Fun and just yeah, fun stuff. All right. Well, anyway, I hope you've enjoyed our what if today. Uh, yes, I enjoyed it. So Tim, it is time to wrap up. He's getting a little rowdy in here. Maybe we'll go out and look like Eckler. Look, like there, there's some sort of bet going on. They're going to have some sort of contest. I don't know. Oh, dogs pulling us. Dog sled? Tr- something, yeah, but it's, uh, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff on that sled. Okay, I interesting. This, they be- said like, like just tons of money are on the table, but we'll see. Wow, could be an interesting event. Yeah, so we, yeah, let's get out there. So let's finish Okay, this yeah, here. we'll wrap this up. Um, thank you for listening to Derailed Trains of Thought. If you want to check out our website, that is at derailedtrainsofthought.blogspot.com. You can uh, listen to us also on iTunes and Stitcher and Spotify. And like we said earlier, feel free to leave us a uh, review and a rating. It does uh, help more people find our wonderful madhouse of storytelling nonsense. And if you have you know, a response to one of our previous questions or uh, even just a question for us, like a topic you'd love to see us cover, email us at uh, derailtrains at gmail.com. Let's leave them with a question again, Tim. We okay. We can do that more. Oh, you know what? Well, let's use one of. We'll pick a. We've got two names here in the hat that we have not used yet. Okay. Not used yet. Give, so give them both of them or one of them? Um, pick your favorite. Pick my favorite. 
Let's do Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins. And you can pick any of the locations, the nature locations that we used before, or come up with one of your own. Yeah, tell us. Write us a little a little paragraph story, and we'd be happy to share it. Yeah, that'd be cool. For my soundtrack today, because I have the closing soundtrack today, I mostly picked this because I had been listening to the OC Remix album, Hometown Heroes. Oh, good album. Which is, it's a fun album. It's like basically a bunch of town themes from uh, RPG games. It's fun, nice thing to listen to in the car when if you're, especially if you're just going around, driving around mm-hmm. town. And this got stuck in my head recently. And it's one of those songs that you don't really mind being stuck in your head because the chorus is just that catchy. But this is called Home Again. It's a remix from Sukuden 3 by Jurito and Earth Kid. My connection to our actual topic here <laughs> is that if uh, the Cheetah Men were the, the wilderness, being home is the civilization. I agree. I think that's a good balance there. So, you know, this, it's nice to, to come home again. And uh, the lyrics of the song kind of reflect that. So, hope you enjoy. It's pretty chill. Um, but I think that's all we got. All right? Yep. So uh, this has been Nick. And this is Tim. Adios. Bye-bye.